Welcome, welcome all. Uh, wonderful that you all uh, are joining this afternoon's uh, lecture uh, and panel. And uh, great that you're here with us on this uh, magic hour of the day. Um, my name is Frederik Bergos and I'm director of If I Can Dance, I Don't Want to Be Part of Your Revolution. Uh, our institution's name is borrowed, as quite a few of you might know, uh, from a quote by the American, but in this context I also want to stress the Lithuanian-born uh, anarchist and feminist Emma Goldman, who lived from uh, 1869 to 1940. And uh, Emma Goldman's uh, Maxim is the continuing uh, guiding principle for our institution, a visual arts organization dedicated to commissioning and researching performance in all its very different forms, manifestations, and sometimes disguises. Working in a biennial rhythm, we work with artists and researchers like Suzanne uh, on performance productions, uh, and we do this per edition through a specific lens. And in this edition, the lens is bodies and technologies. With this team in mind, you can imagine that we are very excited to have as one of the researchers in this edition, Suzanne Altman working on the bodies and technologies theme from the perspective of women's artistic production in former East Germany and the erstwhile Eastern Bloc. And she does so in a way, and that is really crucial, in which she is reorienting historical understandings of the region in relation to Eastern Europe rather than to the West. So first of all, thank you, Suzanne, uh, for being with us in the program uh, and with us today. Uh, and sharing parts of your research process that will culminate in a publication that we will present at the end of next year, also again here in Amsterdam. I also would like to welcome the panelists, Esther Sakak, sorry, it's Esther, if, if it's... <laughs> uh, Robbie Schweiger, uh, as well as Christa Maria lerm uh, the latter also representing the Netherlands Institute for Cultural Analysis and the Amsterdam School for Heritage, Memory and Material Culture, uh, as well as Spur 25 uh, for uh, connecting us with the UVA. Uh, uh, so thank you for hosting us, and thank you, Christa, for... Uh, uh, engaging um, the lecture and the panel of uh, Susanna in the bigger program uh, called uh, titles Collectivities and Technologies Entangled. Um, in addition, uh, I would like to say that this event would not have been possible without the support of the AFK, the Mondrian Fund and Amodo, and also a special thank you to the Goethe Institute Amsterdam. I now hand over to my dear colleague Megan Hutger, who is curating Suzanne Altman's project, uh, so beautifully orchestrated the whole Collectivities and Technologies Entangled program together with Mia, and will be our moderator of today's event. So thank you, Megan, for the program, and I gladly hand over to you. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to give a bit of an introduction and a framework for how we got to today. Uh, the conversations leading up to this program began early uh, this last summer over coffee on the I Film Museum Terrace, where Susanna Altman, our special guest tonight, Mia and I met all together for the first time. Our discussion that windy morning traversed a range of topics, but two key points of discussion were Document 15 and the post vinda historicization of what was East German art and culture, two points that are foundational to this evening's gathering. But before going further on these two points, I want to back up a little and share some moments from the much longer conversation out of which our work with Susanna at If I Can't Dance first began. In fall 2020, If I Can't Dance embarked on a month-long live stream series entitled Mythologies, Methodologies, Approaching Feminist Collectivities of the 1970s and 80s, which brought together the work of three feminist scholars engaged in histories of feminist collective practices across Italy, France, and the Netherlands. It was then that Susanna wrote to me through private channels, expressing her enthusiasm for the program, but also wondering where the representation of socialist Eastern Europe was within an event series on these kinds of collectivities from the 70s and 80s. 
Her words rattled around in my head for months and ultimately inspired me to extend an invitation to Susanna to join the If I Can't Dance Edition 9 Bodies and Technologies program. Her work with If I Can't Dance over 2022 and 23 offers a kind of corrective to that gap she so aptly identified in the live stream series. But her work is also much more than that. It is to my mind pioneering in its commitment to the project of a revisionist art history, both on the fronts of feminism and the so-called former East. What Susanna's work offers forth is an analysis of a kind of aesthetic or artistic intellectual history that is not determined against or within Western frameworks of reference, but instead situated within the resilient networks that moved through socialist uh, Eastern Europe and the ways artists there articulated their vexed relations to things like production, standardization, automatization, labor, education, and collectivity through chosen artistic forms, whether it be photography or textile design. As it turns out, the Mythologies Methodologies program on collectivities and the feedback from Susanna that it prompted have proven to be more prescient than I could have imagined back in 2020. The upheavals related to the recent Documenta 15 in Castle have made this clear. As director of the Van Abbe Museum, uh, Charles Escher recently articulated at the Uncommon Grounds reflecting on Documenta 15 gathering at, at Framer Framed, uh, another institution here in Amsterdam, D Document to 15 proposed a, and I quote, clear and present danger to the valuation evaluation system of artistic production, exposing its institutions as, quote, stuck in old models of critique and with it artistic autonomy. As such, it has posed a kind of, and I quote again, existential crisis for the art world. Esha's observation is both true and itself somewhat stuck in a Western European perspective where the battle between the autonomous and the socially engaged stretches back across generations of voices. As artist Florian Kramer so beautifully mapped in his presentation for Uncommon Grounds, debates around Ron Grupa's curation of the quinquennial arts event have unfolded within the fraught memory politics of West Germany, largely in the Futon section of media outlets there. But what about the other Germany, form, former East Germany, where the collective and collective practice meant and mean very different things, as did and do the cult uh, cultural and political memory surrounding them? Discussions with uh, Mia, as I know her, uh, uh, that were the motor for our gathering today began from a pressing shared observation. The absence of discussions of East Germany in the heated debates around collective practice and memory politics that have been playing out in the discourse surrounding D15. But our focus today is not on Documenta, though it does serve as our backdrop. The hope for today is to open up space to think about that which has thus far been unthinkable in the unfolding discussion, the post-socialist East of Europe, in particular of East Germany. What would it mean to approach questions around collective practice and German memory politics from this perspective? What would it mean to approach collectivity through its historical context just east of Kassel, that's where Documenta is held, where conflicting forms of collectivity, even if not necessarily, and for good reason, were not called by that name, were being inscribed outside and alongside the socialist party apparatus. Speaking to me just yesterday, Susanna was describing that in the publication, which will be created out of her research trajectory with If I Can't Dance, one of her organizational strategies will be the networks or scenes within which artists, poets, and cultural producers were moving in conversation with one another. What would it mean to hold the historical, intellectual, and aesthetic context of this collective ethos next to instrumentalized state forms of collectivity, setting aside the binaries of the autonomous and the socially engaged, and facing the kind of historical aphasia that has determined discursive and historical frames in the post the contemporary? Mia, many thanks for including me in such a rigorous conversation so we could get to today uh, and working for me, uh, with me to realize the event. Without further ado, though, I'd like to now introduce uh, our special guest who has brought uh, us all together. Susanna Altman is an independent feminist art historian, curator, and leading scholar in the contextualization of women's artistic production in former East Germany. Alongside her various curatorial and publishing activities, her historical research focuses on art production in the former socialist parts of Europe, where uh, before and after 1989, investigating the development of a canon and modes of reception for nonconformist avant-garde. 
Recent projects include the landmark exhibition, uh, the Medea Insurrection, Women Artists Behind the Iron Curtain, at the Albertinum, the Dresden State Art Collections in 2018, which then traveled on to the Vinda Museum Los Angeles in 2020. Uh, the exhibition, Pantswear Skirts, the Air Force Women Artist Group, 1984 to 94, uh, for which she was a co-curator at the Inge Be uh, Beka in Berlin in 2021, just closed at the beginning of this year. And next year, there will be a publication coming out from that. And uh, literally just finished, a, a literary transcription of British artist Monica Ross's text-based work, Valentine. For the last two decades, she's worked as a correspondent for Art Das, a Kunst magazine, and since 2010, teaches German and contemporary art history at the Ac Academy of Fine Arts in Dresden as part of the Erasmus uh, DAAD program. So without further ado, uh, Suzanne, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, Emma, if I can't dance, I can dance here. That's great. That's why I'm part of the revolution. Um, thank you, Frederic. Uh, thank you, Megan, for having me and trusting me and supporting me. Uh, thank you, Mia, for the same. <laughs> and uh, thanks, Esther. Esther uh, Sokac and Robbie Sch Schweicher uh, for joining the panel today, as does Mia. Um, thank you for coming. I thank all the supporters, but I don't want to give up uh, too much from my um, precious time by following the protocol um, of, of thanking the funding bodies and so on. Anyway. Um, I, I'm grateful very much to have the opportunity to be here. Um, let me, yes, that's, that's my starting slide. Um, Megan has pointed out very um, clearly that um, I think the legacy of uh, socialism, which we call now still after 33 years or more, we call post-socialism, but that this legacy or heritage or however we call it still is uh, to be researched more thoroughly in the first place, but also um, has a lot of influence of um, what's going on today geopolitically, which the Ukraine war, I think, showed us very impressively. For me, this was, I must admit, uh, it's not only a terminology, terminological problem, but it's also, um, if I say, for instance, Russian avant-garde, right, which applies to the time before 1917, before the so-called October Revolution or February Revolution, um, this is not Russian art, what I'm talking about. I'm talking, um, at the same token, I'm talking about artists that come from, by origin, from Ukraine or Belarus or um, other, let's say, territories of what then or was the Tsarist Empire, but not entirely, but then was this, uh, I was going to say Soviet Empire, but uh, never mind, um, the, Soviet U uh, the Soviet Union. So this is something I rather say Soviet avant-garde, although it doesn't include important tendencies before 1917, instead of saying Russian avant-garde, because this is also unfair. So this is a bit of a... Um, dilemma, but we get over it. Um, the, um, my investigation in, in uh, connection with the um, uh, If I Can't Dance Research Commission Body and Technology um, circled around how, um, and I'm an art historian, I can't help it seeing that way, um, uh, circled around how the representation of the female body changed around 19, the 1900s when women artists began to take charge and um, 
when the traditional male gaze after, well, millennia uh, was um, started to be um, abandoned. And a very important uh, uh, issue in this kind of change of paradigms was the socialist perspective on women. And when I, um, after Robi Schweiger recommended it yesterday, when I went to the Stedelijk and the new uh, collection presentation, like the first really eye catcher that I found was a poster. Um, from 1930, a, a Soviet poster, um, the International Day of uh, the Women Workers. Like, I don't know, Международный день работниц. And um, which was, of course, um, um, in this typical colors, red, white, and black, and has this uh, aesthetics that we know. We know it of Rachenko, but we should be aware that he was not the only one. Uh, um, his companion, Bavara Stepanova, and uh, Lyubov Popova, as women artists, still are too little known, but they all contributed to use this, uh, uh, in the best sense at that time, propaganda aesthetics to convey uh, slogans and messages and uh, stuff like we're celebrating women workers now, which was, of course, before not really uh, the um, task of the day. It, um, I think a great deal to the emancipation of women in general, but also women artists had to do in Europe with the end of World War II and this uh, terrible losses in male population that forced women to come forward to join the labor force and uh, to join the cultural life more prominently. Same applies, of course, to the Soviet Union or to Russia at this point. Um, we have an exceptional situation there, like uh, politically, after 1917, but we already had an artistically interesting situation before 1917, because um, I didn't know that before, because um, uh, women could join art academies uh, even before this, uh, this was uh, possible in the so-called West. Mostly they came from well-to-do families, um, but still it was an emancipated climate and it was nothing special for a woman to uh, become a visual artist. Also, uh, the Russian um, artists in general, but the women artists uh, logically, traveled uh, to Western Europe a lot. Like I think most of them had a second home base in uh, Paris, where they became, and I'm talking uh, about 1910, 11, 12, 13, where they came in touch with uh, Cubism and uh, the strong Italian influence of Futurism. But still, if we see these stylistic similarities with I don't know, Braque, Picasso, and um, Delaunay. Um, we still can't really, uh, and this is this is uh, this is also a, I I don't know um, um, a graph omission of Western art history that because it looks like that it must be this ism which is uh, established in the canon. Um, I think. Not I think, a lot of scholars <laughs> think along with me that um, the um, Soviet Cubo futurism, the Soviet avant-garde, was really something else than the aesthetic phenomenon of, um, of Cubism. Futurism is a little bit uh, different because it's about technology and progress and, and kind of celebrating um, the speed and, and uh, yeah, devices like technological devices, but still, uh, the Soviet climate is very special because starting 1917, the artistic development, the fascination with technology and with uh, dynamisms and again, speed industries and so on followed. Uh, an ideology, and the ideology was to turn a um, hitherto uh, pretty rural country where serfdom 
uh, was was still the kind of uh, ruling um, pattern in agriculture to turn a country like this um, into an advanced industrialized uh, country. And uh, this, for several reasons, seemed to need the ideology of um, Marxism further developed into um, the Leninist version of communism. And, um, but again, when we talk about the early days after the revolution, we must uh, understand that there was, there was a uh, genuine um, interest, a genuine uh, passion of the artists and intellectuals to take part in this uh, development and to contribute um, to this change of society. Um, here we go a little bit further. And um, also when we discussed yesterday, when we discussed the uh, um, Stedelik, the Kharjiev uh, collection of Russian avant-garde, you don't have, you hardly have any women artists there. And uh, this is something which you can't understand because women artists in this uh, scene of, of Moscow and, and St. Petersburg and then Leningrad, um, they were not invisible. They were an absolutely equal righted uh, part of, of this artist circles and artist uh, scenes. So it, it's impossible to overlook them also because most of their contributions um, I'm coming to that later, um, are really um, innovations in the context of traditional art. So, yeah, here you see the, um, how the, um, this is not, in this case, it's not a female body, but you see how the um, visual language of, uh, let's say, cubo-futurism, which is said to be a Soviet coined term, um, affected the notion of the human body. So this is a peasant, and, um, but it, it or he looks uh, in a way like a machine. And on the other hand side, this uh, pavilion for an agricultural fair by um, Alexandra Exter, also one of the female protagonists of that scene, looks pretty much anthropomorphic. So you, you see in the uh, early 20s already like this blurring vision uh, as, as in pathological, uh, but not, um, but it, it like the um, human being blurs or kind of mixes with the machine and also uh, with this kind of entire fascin. This is not. Uh, characteristically Soviet or Russian, like at that time the fascination for um, artificial uh, beings or the visuality of what we would call it cyberspace, I think they called it rather cos cosmos, cosmic, uh, back then was an uh, international phenomenon and when Alexandra Exter, and this is not um, her Aelita, the film is being shown at the Stedelik in the collection in a big uh, projection now, which I um, found out yesterday. To my delight, Exter is is not uh, her. The film by, oh my God, Yakov Pratasanov, um, uh, where she made the stage de parts of the stage design, but uh, first and foremost the costumes. They of course derive a lot from kind of utopian. Um, aesthetics and, and visions how life in space, like highly technology-based life in space, of course, uh, must be. They are on the Mars, um, basically, and the other film, I think everybody knows, it's Metropolis. But um, both, uh, both films are not political in a way, but you can see with that of the West, that, that technology, like Fritz Lang's film, uh, Metropolis, that technology is approached with mistrust and um, critically. And um, Alexandra Exter's um, figurines aside, uh, this was strongly different from... Um, 
from the Soviet Union because technology was not um, kind of the enemy or something that would cause uh, unpleasant change of the routines of civilization, but this was highly welcomed. This was the tool, this was the means to uh, change society. Um, now, um, this invitation and the idea of Mias and uh, Mergens uh, brought in the concept of the collective, collectivity, collectivism, which I didn't think about too much before. But the moment I got alerted to this, it was clear that you can't say Soviet Union without saying industrialization, without saying uh, collectivism, without saying, did I say industrialization? Uh, maybe not yet, standardization and mass actions, and mass actions in the way that not only a lot of people were um, in labor, a lot of new industries had to be founded, because it was really Lenin's ambitious vision to, to uh, turn the Soviet Union into a in, in modern industrial uh, country. But also you had a lot of people which had to be organized. So the desire for organizing uh, the daily life, organizing it mentally and, and kind of socially, socio-politically, but also physically. I mean, you, you had to, uh, this new uh, state had to produce fit people that, that were able to carry um, the vision of industrialization or put it in um, practice. I'm sure you have heard about the famous Lenin words that uh, Soviet Union plus electrification results in communism. Have you? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but this, uh, as, a, as a young student in GDR, this has always impressed me as utter, utter, uh, I don't know, infeasible, <laughs> unfeasible. Um, here you see um, uh, dawning um, the efforts that visual artists that really saw themselves, again, as part of the movement, that visual artists undertook to um, engage in this mass culture. It, uh, actually, it never happened. Whatever Lubov Popova and her partner, Alexander Vyesnin, ar architect, uh, what they devised to celebrate uh, this... Uh, Congress of the thir Third International, but it was thought as a mass festival where this kind of stage-like device machine should play uh, um, as an essential role within the choreography of masses, where we never will learn um, what's going on there, but we have a very similar uh, work by Yubov Popova, which has been uh, realized in, um, within the concept of production art, because working class, Soviet Union, it was so much about uh, producing, production, optimizing, I don't know if there's a word to make something more effective, anyway, um, both the human being and uh, the environment, um, let the artists and also, I mean, first of all, women artists, because they, for, I don't know if this is uh, politically correct, but women are somehow closer to applied arts and, uh, and to kind of designing the environment. Uh, let these artists to ask themselves and their colleagues the question, how can I engage in this, like, really... Um, make sense or make a contribution in this context uh, of society. And they identified certain, um, certain aspects. One was theater, the other one was uh, design in, in all different uh, uh, ramifications, like textile design, um, farfor, porcelain, ceramics. And, uh, and also very prominently uh, poster design, book 
design typography. So where they could feel or they identified their place, not their niche, really their place in society by seeing themselves as productionists. I can't go uh, into the discussions that they had. They were discussing, I have the uh, feeling that they were discussing the entire 20s. They had these um, this institution-like bodies, with, like very Russian, Inchuk, Futemas, Narkompros, this kind of, um, uh, how's, it, how's it called? Um, the, for, uh, Acronymic, acronymic uh, abbreviations, and all these, uh, all these people discussed how they can better themselves and um, their future. So they discussed what, for instance, a productionist artist uh, distinguishes from a constructivist artist. But I can't go deeper into this because these, these, these were really highly um, intellectual discussions and. Um, I was really surprised after researching and reading a lot about that time in several languages. I myself had the impression that they play a lot, and this was also due to my so socialist upbringing, that it's a lot about formulas, like, like, like almost a religion where the word has to become flesh, like, like the conjuring up verbally some vision that will come true if you only believe in it and say it often enough. And this is very reminiscent of, I think, what uh, they did back in, in the day, talking a lot and trying to reassure themselves about their position in society. And uh, when uh, Lyubov Popova, she unfortunately died very young in uh, 1924, when she did this stage for a famous theater director, Zevalot um, Meyerhold. She included words and uh, the machine and um, like technology. So the actor in itself was not so so important. It wasn't for this innovative theater theater director Meyerhold anyway, because it was much more about the body making movements and gestures that could be deciphered on the same level that words of, of, of the play um, could be um, understood. But it's like, it's really uh, about creating, that's interesting, Ideolo it's ideology. And as with the collective, there are um, how we perceive of concepts like the collective, like socialism, or um, these left, leftish sounding words, we really have to uh, understand very carefully what did they mean at the day when they were, when they were crea uh, created. So um, this was a world full of slogans and full of uh, formulas. Um, yeah, I, I said applied arts was also very, um, uh, or was the main, uh, the main turf for the productive for productivist artists, and you see the sports gear that uh, Vavara Stepanova created, and you see how it is put in, <laughs> in practice uh, here. A lot of these artists who were also organized in in these several associations and institutions that I was talking of. It's really very uh, variety of 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 networks. Uh, but a lot of them were in Moscow uh, for at least for a time, even Alexandra Exter, who went to Paris uh, very early. But they were part of the teaching body of the so-called Frutemas. We saw previously these kind of gymnasts um, um, event. Frutemas was the higher, um, the higher workshops for art and production, um, I, I, I would know the Russian, but that makes no sense here. So they were also all trying to um, hand down their knowledge, which was often very, uh, just newly acquired knowledge, to students and the students. And, and often Fruit Mass is being compared with Bauhaus because of these uh, uh, avant-garde aesthetics. And, but honestly, uh, Bauhaus was a village school uh, compared with Fruit Mass. Like um, 
there were really hundreds and hundreds of students uh, and uh, um, organized in different departments, diff um, uh, experimental uh, works which the Bauhaus didn't even think of, like un under the early um, Weimar uh, rule of Johannes Itten, you wouldn't think of including projection theater or, or like cross cross media practices. And this all um, happened at uh, Fruit de Mars, and on top of it all, it was a state. Um, a state academy or, or a state institution fully funded, not that they were rich, uh, they all were starving, but it was, uh, it had support of the state and first and foremost of the uh, famous um, uh, commissioner Luna Charsky of the um, uh, State Committee of Enlightenment, which means uh, education. Yeah, this is also um, a pro productionist art by Lyubov Popova. Um, not meant for, as everyday clothes, but she also designed very similar everyday clothes as Vavara did with the um, sports gear. And uh, Rodchenko, also uh, Stepanova's husband, uh, designed this, like working gear for the working class artists. So this was all... Uh, uh, statements, this, but this is theater costumes for uh, just another play. And you can see, see the actors are not referred to with the name of a role, but they, they number, they act, they act a number five and number six. Um, this was also, I can really only briefly touch upon this. This was um, um, an attempt of artists and intellectuals to optimize physical labor. To, to analyze the movements and to, uh, to make the um, um, gesture of the hand uh, uh, working a chisel or a hammer more effective. And they employed for that, uh, they employed new vis visualization that reminded of Edward Mybridge's uh, uh, sequential photography, but was even more advanced, but not for the sake of aesthetics, rather for the sake of productivity. And then we have, when we talk about the collective, we talk about education. And we have this guy, um, Anton Semyonovich, Anton Semyonovich Makarenko, um, who as, as an instructor, as an educator, uh, established kind of um, it's, I, I don't want to call it camps, but it, it, those were facilities for um, young people, um, criminals or otherwise deviant people. And he tried to, to um, apply his theories about collective education there, like really improving uh, the human being, <laughs> uh, the young human being, molding it into the new man of the Soviet kind. Um, and um, I think if you read Makarenko, I don't know if someone, uh, someone's here who is going to be part of the workshop tomorrow, um, because then you might have read some Makarenko excerpts already. Um, he seems to be a warm-hearted person who talks a, a lot about the interests of the collective and how the individual must, um, must be not suppressed, but uh, um, obey the interest of the collective and uh, so on. He, he doesn't sound like a total author, author, authoritarian figure or kind of a totalitarian um, person. But in the end, his uh, writings or, and the film, The Road to Life, um, have after 1945 been used to, um, yes, um, have been used to to influence the new socialist states. And this is, how I say we, how we grew up with these ideas that were kind of handed down, sort of uh, uh, perver perverted um, into really authoritarian, uh, uh, into a really authoritarian climate. Um, this is just, um, if you have the, um, 
uh, opportunity to watch this film from the 1930s is hardly known. We all know experimental film uh, from uh, Soviet Union, of course, Eisenstein and Ziga Vertov. Um, but this is a very interesting film where you can see how this collective body in a facility uh, for, work, for the working class, including childcare and collective feeding and so on, uh, works. Um, it's uh, available online. And um, this is just really only a um, um, visual reminder. Um, the female body within this technology, within the machinery of industrialization, plays a big part in the previous film. Um, because you can really see that women are uh, equal righted partners in development uh, of, of the industries. And here you have a different approach. Rochenko, this film never came out. It's highly ambivalent because it shows the individual, like this woman, uh, in all her fragility within a technological environment. It's, a, uh, it's about a, uh, a printing factory. But you have these cross cuts all the time where you see this uh, woman who suffers for, from some uh, love sickness, who knows. But uh, cross cut with uh, industrial, uh, an industrial environment, which is, I, I think, very um, interesting to see. It says something about the mindset of these um, Soviet artists. But then, as you know, Lenin died and Stalin took a while uh, before he uh, implemented socialist realism, which um, made it hard for uh, these early Soviet artists to exist further and, and to pursue their kind of avant-garde approaches. And this was actually, and um, I don't have a lot of uh, time anymore, but you, you see that there's also a lot to say, and I hope I can catch up on that uh, next year. <laughs> and um, that the essence of socialist culture was not derived from the early avant-garde when it was implemented in, after 1945 into the new socialist uh, states, but rather that was what came behind, like this uh, still kind of celebration of working class, but really socialist realism as a different uh, form of um, um, celebrating culture and making culture the servant of, of uh, socialism. And a lot of artists uh, I know, uh, especially in GDR, where the verdict uh, over the command of the day was socialism much more than, let's say, in Hungary or uh, Poland. A lot of artists responded to that with, uh, res uh, with uh, subversive means. So what's that? Uh, that photographer who uh, didn't show working class heroines, Evelyn Richter is her name, but she showed uh, the female body in an overpowering uh, industrial environment. So the machine is, is, is not the ally, as in the early Russian, early, early Soviet climate, but the machine is alienation and um, hostile. You hardly see her, right? So this is, I think this, these are great uh, interpretations of this kind of climate in state socialism. And you also have... Um, Painting, and I call this, is not social realism, it is social surrealism, because it says a lot about how the collective, which has been so much praised as, as a foundation of uh, socialism, dissolves into fatigued, exhausted, uh, very skeptical women. This is also um, Eastern Germany. And you, you also see women, this is actually interesting, 1992, after the capitalization of um, common property, they're all about to lose their um, jobs in these big factories. And you see, like, industries uh, um, dealt with uh, in a very skeptical, melancholic uh, way, picturing decay and, and destruction and the vulnerability of the individual. So very, very far from any uh, celebratory 
uh, approach. And my last, uh, the last thing I was going to show you is uh, these. It's not figurines. It's actually uh, costumes. And um, the women from the Effort Women Artists Collective, a show and a publication that I'm doing with four other colleagues, and Megan thankfully mentioned it already, that um, kind of in the early 80s, and my, one doesn't one shouldn't underestimate the power of late of the late state socialism it was a very peculiar time where still like uh, teaching doctrines like makarenko's were still in a uh, place there were books written about it and they were tried to be applied in schools and uh, although a lot of people already were disillusioned and knew we have to either leave the country or make the best uh, of out of being here. So these artists from Erfurt did not want to leave Eastern Germany, but rather formed a feminist, and this was a rare phenomenon, fe uh, feminist collective for uh, eight millimeter films, live performances in these kind of costumes that remind, uh, remind of the figurines of, so social, uh, of Soviet avant-garde, as you can see, this is a newspaper costume, but they, they mocked they mocked it. They picked up on the aesthetics, but said, "Well, this is all empty. Uh, this is all empty phrases. Um, what's being written in the newspaper or the antenna costume is very important because 90% um, of the people, except Dresden, where I come from, because it's a valley, uh, watched West German television." So the antenna uh, was an extremely important device of uh, the media coming in and not the streamlined ideological media from the state. So yeah. So uh, this was just a very brief, brief trajectory of uh, my research and how I actually try to, to connect uh, these stories of the 20th century in um, in a more accessible and not uh, or hitherto uncanonized way. Um, thank you for your uh, attention. I think there will be a lot to talk about later on. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Susanna, for, for such a nice uh, talk and also for getting us started for the conversation to follow. I failed to mention that following Susanna's talk, we'll have a round table with Mia, with Esther Sakach, and with Robbie Schweiger. But before we go there, I want to ask if there are any immediate questions that you feel like you can't wait until the end. Maybe a clarification about something Susanna said. Okay. Well, no immediate questions. So then I'm actually going to ask Mia, Esther, and Robbie if you want to come up. Uh, Susanna, if you also want to take a seat. Yeah. So what we, we to proposed to, um, to the three of them. Oh, yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, yeah, I'll introduce you once you're up there. Um, what we proposed was actually for them to give a, a five-minute or so response to Susanna's talk and to open it out a bit into different geographies, different socialist, post-socialist geographies from there. Uh, Is there a seating order? No, no. Just make sure you turn on your mics before. Okay, I'll give that one to you. And there we go. Okay, before I invite you to give responses, I'm just gonna give a quick bio on the three of you. So. Christa Maria Lerm Hayes is professor in the middle here, maybe you wave, is professor of modern and contemporary art history at the University of Amsterdam and academic director of the Amsterdam School for Heritage, Memory and Material Culture. She's interested in social art practices, uh, performance, post-war art histories and artistic research. Her books include Brian O'Doherty, Patrick Ireland, Word, Image and Institutional Critique, uh, Post-War Germany and Objective Chance, uh, W.G. Sebald, Joseph Boys, and Tassida Dean, Joyce in Art, and James Joyce als um, Inspiration und Kelle für Joseph Boys. She has curated internationally. This is where I'm going to leave it. Uh, Robbie Schweiger, maybe you can wave. 
has worked as a curator, researcher, writer, and educator. He studied art history at the University of Amsterdam and Russian and Eurasian studies at Leiden University. Since 2019, he has been affiliated with the Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam as a researcher of collections, archive, library, and art collection. For his research and artistic networks in Central Asia, he received an NWO Museum grant in 2021. And last but not least, Esther Sakash. Yep, there we go. Is a curator, researcher, and PhD candidate at ASCA, uh, that's the Amsterdam School of Cultural Analysis, at the University of Amsterdam, where she's taking part in the, in the project Imagine Art. Esther is on the curatorial team of the Grassroots Art Initiative Off Biennial Budapest, uh, with which they, uh, they are Lumbung members and document of 15 participants. She was a member of the East Europe Biennial Alliance team that collectively curated the Kiev Biennial in 2021. And Esther's research and writing revolve around grassroots art organizing outside state art infrastructures. So it's a great group we have up here. And I'm going to actually maybe leave it up to the three of you. If somebody wants to go first, I did not have an order in mind. Is it working? Yeah. I hear myself. Uh, thank you, Megan, for the introduction, and thank you, Suzanne, for the wonderful lecture. Um, yeah, I will shortly uh, tell you something about my own research and how it also somewhat follows the same trajectories as uh, Suzanne's research. Um, so my research at the Stedelijk Museum uh, departs from uh, late Tsarist and uh, early Soviet avant-garde. Uh, going around the word Russian here, as uh, Susan uh, was also trying to do. Um, yeah, and this is a, an important part of the Stedelijk collection. Um, and yeah, the part of the uh, uh, part of the avant-garde practices that ended up in Amsterdam is only a small part. It's mainly abstract paintings by uh, by men, and um, yeah. Uh, this is yeah, a result of, of multiple things, of like sort of a neutralization of the uh, yeah, original promises of the avant-garde and also a commercialization of the art world. Um, but yeah, as a result, a lot of a lot of the yeah, original promises and um, experiments uh, of the avant-garde got sort of lost on the way uh, to Amsterdam. So what we try to do uh, at the museum is uh, to do research um, on the context of these works um, and yeah, the context in which they were made, uh, of what they were part of, and also to look at what, what was not collected, which was a lot, because these artworks are just a very small part of uh, the artistic explorations of uh, yeah in sound and film and performance textile ceramics product design like Suzanne also uh, showed us yeah it really went in all directions from social experiments and experiments for the extension of human senses like painting with two hands at the same time to be able to to expand your vision and like very interesting uh, experiments but also to uh, uh, about ideas of genderless immortality in the cosmos by means of technological uh, advancements. Um, yeah, and as Susan pointed out, uh, male and female contributions uh, of these artistic explorations were very much equal, uh, which yeah cannot be stressed enough, and which also yeah is very important to uh, to stress uh, in the light of the Stedelijk collection, which is mainly male. Um, and yeah, so Susan is right that the presence of women was significant, but I do think that it's important to say that uh, uh, women had double work as they uh, were still expected to perform uh, labor as wives, mothers, caretakers and homemakers. And I think it's important not to romanticize their, their role. Um, and uh, yeah female bodies as technological tools also had to function uh, uh, for care work and reproduction because yeah there were a lot of like new laborers needed um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah reproduction yeah and so yeah this sort of uh, sourceification uh, of collective bodies uh, as as 
uh, yeah, or bodies as technological tools, unequally targeted women, but also uh, uh, colonial subjects from the 1920s uh, onwards. Or like there are discussions if uh, about comparing like the Soviet empire of the yeah again Soviet empire no that's the Tsarist empire and the Soviet Union um, how that relates to post-colonial discourse but um, uh, yeah Soviet society was far from being a, a, a society without hierarchies and especially uh, uh, when talking about ethnic hierarchies. And yeah, apart from material resources that were extracted in the peripheries of the Soviet Union, there was also a lot of extraction of labor uh, of non-ethnic Russians. Um, I'll be quick. I, or a few days ago, I attended an online lecture by uh, an Estonian scholar, Ep Anus was her name, and she sort of uh, described Russian colonialism as a colonialism in camouflage, like under the guise of equality and the idea of brothership of nations and like, um, yeah, fem feminism, etc. But yeah, the elder Russian brother, uh, broad civilization, industry, technology, culture, education, or like enlightenment as, uh, as the um, Lunacharsky would call it. And and language, and these were not goals, but actually tools for resourcification. And this all emphasized sort of the inferiority of the other culture while simultaneously appropriating uh, a lot of elements of these other culture as Russian, like under the category of Russian. And this is also still what, what is the, yeah, the case in a lot of uh, art institutions. So it is good to look at this Russian label. Um, and this also continues today in Russia, uh, Russia's war on Ukraine, where Ukrainian culture is actively destroyed and certain eleme elements are appropriated. And at the same time, uh, mobilization for the Russian army mainly happens amongst uh, non-ethnic Russian communities. Um, yeah, that was... Oh yeah, and then also... Uh, my research, just like Susan, sort of expands uh, to uh, post-war, uh, uh, to the post-war period. And it's also interesting to see that, uh, like in the 20s, 30s, but also, uh, uh, yeah, 40s and 50s, a lot of, like, avant-gardists, not, not the most famous one, but the ones that were around uh, artists like Malevich, for example. For different reasons, they uh, they moved to uh, the peripheries of the Soviet Union, and I'm doing a research. Oh, yeah, sorry, um, into artist networks in Central Asia uh, that sort of collectively formed around uh, around thinkers or artists that moved to the peripheries and. Um, yeah, established their own circles where they sort of a reference to this avant-garde aesthetic also, but at the same time they um, they uh, are very critical or they they are exploring like their own national identity and like ancestral knowledge uh, and like secret knowledge that was not uh, that was uh, yeah not allowed to be practiced uh, during the Soviet Union. Um, I don't know, I, I'll just stop and then. <laughs> yes. yeah. Thanks so much, Susanne, Robbie, but especially if I can dance, Frederic, Megan. It's wonderful to be here in my home, <laughs> in a way, um, from the UFA and um, uh, yeah, welcome others and uh, work with um, people from the art sector in Amsterdam and uh, more broadly, and even bring in my own biographical <laughs> background. My family is from the uh, Erfurt region and Dresden and so on. Uh, so it's a uh, um, it, it's a rare occasion to bring my research in art history here together with um, all of your work. So um, I see my uh, task in a way here as um, 
um, doing what you already started doing in a way, uh, making the material that you presented from um, uh, not so much Soviet enthusiasm in the beginning of the 20th century, but more the tiredness and the dissidence from uh, uh, the years leading up to the 9th of November 1989, where it, it, this is the day. Yeah, uh, so we are uh, <laughs> gathering here on this um, very historic date for and in German history, not uh, just the opening of um, the Iron Curtain fall of the uh, Berlin Wall and the other hundreds of kilometers of it, um, but also the Kristallnacht uh, before that, um, uh, the day on which the Nazis um, burned synagogues in, in Germany. So the 9th of November has a, has a big resonance in German history. So to um, connect um, that material to the present day, um, I want to sketch three um, situations. I want to tell you that one of the Erfurt women uh, collective artists, Gabriele Stötzer, has told me about how they, um, uh, or she personally, had had experience of sitting in the Stasi prison in Erfurt and knew how many cells there were in the women's tract. And then, uh, on the 9th of November, when the, uh, everything changed, and in the days thereafter, she saw the Stasi members um, uh, destroy files um, in their archive. And um, she went uh, to her women collaborators and said, we have to do something about this. Uh, this is the truth. These are our files. This has to, to be remembered, and this is the only tool for justice ever to come about. Uh, what will we do? And uh, they decided, she and another woman, uh, to go to the mayor of Erfurt and convince him that it was the people's property that these Stasi people were destroying, that the Stasi members were the criminals and not the women who were about to occupy the Stasi archives. And they succeeded. So they established a different law. They um, got um, their civil disobedience, their plans to be rebadged as civil obedience, um, obedience of another law. And that was the first Stasi archive that was occupied. And uh, this is how uh, we now know the truth. Um, it's artists' collective work in the real world that manages to do such things. So that's the first um, sketch. The second sketch, um, in March this year, Three weeks or so into the Russian aggressive uh, war in Ukraine, there were a number of artists, communi um, communities, artists, individuals, and so on, on Zoom meeting. And uh, they um, contained Stodelad members and uh, Ukrainian artists and uh, theorists from all over the world. In actual fact, um, New York-based artist Gregory Schillett invited me. And uh, it was amazing to see that among those two dozen people or so, Walter Mignolo, the decolonial scholar, was on one of the Zoom screens. And he sat there. Usually you see if people do email or something. And no, he sat there with arms crossed and listened very attentively to Ukrainian artists presenting uh, what they were facing, what they were thinking, um, how yeah, the strategies they um, uh, could uh, engage in, and what the help they wanted, and so on. And about a, an hour and a half in, the organizers asked Walter Mignolo, um, so we're wrapping up, what uh, do you think? What should be done? And he said, well, new narratives are necessary. New narratives beyond uh, good and bad, beyond, um, you know, um, uh, yeah, perpetrator and, and victim and so on. He started by saying, uh, from my, his Argentinian background, um, I know societies where everybody in Argentina thinks that they are European 
or many, <laughs> like half of the population at least, thinks uh, we are European. So the wish of the Ukrainian uh, population to be an EU member, for example, um, is also uh, somewhat problematic and maybe has an element of self-colonization in it. So new narratives. And somebody piped up, yeah, but they usually come from the West. What do we do with sort of solutions and things like that? And my little contribution was, yeah, maybe we'll go back to the 9th of November, 89, to Putin's trauma and see what that was about. It was about collectives, artists and others, collectivizing grassroots working to change history. And that was what the world cheered about and Putin did not. It destroyed his world. So maybe that kind of thing again. And the third is, of course, documenta and the debates. And you can elaborate on that, Esther, um, that um, uh, in the, the whole discussion, about focusing nearly exclusively on uh, Holocaust remembrance and so on, in, a, uh, in and about a location that is less than an hour's drive from uh, the, <laughs> the former wall, um, the other dictatorship on uh, German soil in the 20th century was not men uh, <laughs> mentioned much. And that is why we organized uh, this event today, to enter uh, the Erfurt's women, um, Erfurt, uh, women's group and uh, to connect uh, different experiences of dictatorships and uh, uh, colonialism in the ways that um, yeah, we all together and only together thank, uh, can. Thank you. Yeah, I would also like to thank you very much to If I Can Dance and to Megan and Mia for the invitation and the organization. And, and thank you very much, Susanna, uh, for your really great lecture and also Roby and Mia for your contribution. And I would like to somehow continue where you left off a little bit, Susanna, and also stressing kind of two points that are dear to my heart, which is uh, collective work, uh, but also working with, within, against a repressive state. And of course, I borrow this with, within, against uh, concept from Athena Athanasiu, who used it in terms of institutions. So how do you work with, within, but, again, but also against? And um, my background is is based in Hungary. And so I refer to some specificities of Hungary. And, and, and also, as Susanna mentioned, there's always been a problem how to talk about Eastern Europe as a region, because it's so diverse. And it's, it's really, there's a library of books about what Eastern Europe is, where it is, and which countries constitute it. And uh, yeah, I would also like to just real briefly mention three things. Um, and I would like to. Uh, uh, start with an Hungarian artist who's 85 now, Dora Maurer, who's also on your orbit, uh, 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 Susanne. And um, uh, I'm also part of, uh, of Biennale Budapest, as Megan mentioned, which is a grassroots art initiative in Budapest. And um, in 2017, we did a few interviews with famous people. Uh, uh, and we asked them also to talk about their work, but also in relation to off Biennale or what they like about it. And, and Dora Maure um, uh, said, uh, yeah, she, she was part of, of uh, many important alternative, she was an alternative artist herself within state socialism, but also part of many groups that organized educational activities, but also exhibitions. And she was a very active, still a very active member. Uh, and has a very robust artistic practice. And, um, and she said that uh, you have to exit a system uh, when, the, when, uh, when the circumstances are not appropriate, and then this exodus can take various forms. Uh, one is activity. And, and if you exit a circle, you build a different circle. Uh, and and that's, that's also a form of community um, organizing. And she said that she has been autonomous since 1956, and uh, 1956 is, of course, the, the Hungarian revolution, failed revolution, I should say, uh, against uh, uh, 
uh, well, the Soviet Empire in, in that sense. And then, um, so she was almost fired from the art academy where she was studying because she started doing art that was not allowed at that time. And then she said, okay, then I'm going to do two things at one. I, have a, I will have an activity A, which is my true art, and then I have an activity B, uh, which will allow me to stay within the art school. And um, yeah, and then she was, and then she said that, um, um, so you'll still be somehow part of the system to a, to a certain degree, but then you will take an ironic step uh, to distance yourself from it. And of course, the emancipatory artistic and organization strategies in state socialism and the contemporary, I should say, illiberal democracy times that we have currently in Hungary, if, of course, uh, they are embedded in different social and political times, but there might be some traits that are shared over time. And one is the primacy of the state. So state patronage, it's, 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 it's yeah, in, in, in Hungary, the main enemy is somehow always the state. Uh, uh, it's the, the it's so it's the, the biggest patronage, the, the the biggest supporter of the arts. If we talk about the arts, but it's also of course the means of control, um, and and also I think an an interesting concept or an interesting thing to look at is again it's working working with within against is that it's not entirely possible to exit the state infrastructure. Uh, so you'll always, in a way, be implicated um, within that. And then, and one of the concepts that actually of Biennale also used is is the off, uh, which comes from Svetlana Boim's off modern uh, theory, uh, which is belonging but also exceeding. So in, in Svetlana Boim used it in terms of belonging to exceeding modernity. But I, I would argue that it also relates to the state, so how you work off this, to the state. So it's not against, but somehow also going beyond it. And then, of course, just the, the uh, off modern is also yeah, trying to um, imagining like what the present or future can be through exploring the possibilities of the past, of the, of the side, at least, as she would say. Um, and then just I would like to throw in another term, fixer, which is actually just to, to uh, refer to Nuraini Julia Suti, who is another uh, uh, part, taking part in the, another commission in if, if, if I Can Dance. She did an, uh, an interview uh, uh, with Ruan Grupa, and then within that other Dharma one, and, uh, and also in, in, in the context of Indonesia, of course, the state's infrastructure is weak, but again, art, in, art initiatives step up, and then this is what other refer to them as fixers. And I, and I really like this idea of the fixer, and then, and then rounding it up and returning to uh, collectivism. And I think it's, and I'm coming also to Documenta, which collective uh, work and collectivism was really, really, really important. I think it was... Uh, um, yeah, it was really clear uh, that within Documenta 15 as a whole, that uh, that the, the invitation of Ruan Grupa was not just to present individuality, but to present ecosystems that we are all embedded in, and to underline that everyone is coming from interdependent and multiple networks and friends, and so it's not just a single achievement, and uh, and through the various discussions we had about you know what was documenta 15 uh, we're still continuing <laughs> but uh, yeah but one of the the, the thing that yes yeah, someone mentioned was that um, it was not something new actually that happened in 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 documenta in a sense but but it was what it brought was what what it shown that how art is actually made so that it is made in community and through uh, collectives and usually in exhibitions you see a final product, uh, but you don't really see what's behind it. And this time it was also an effort to make um, that visible that it's not just an achievement of a single artist or a single artwork, 
but and as, as, as you might know, that it's one group of collective invites another collective, who invites another collective, and then invite further participants. And yeah, and that's, that's how it was 1,500 1, artists. And yeah, I will leave there. Okay, thanks everyone for, sorry, this, this Madonna mic is freaking me out a bit. Um, thanks everybody for sharing some thoughts that sort of respond and, and keep pushing the conversation. I wonder, maybe we start, if you have particular questions for each other that came up when you were hearing Susanna or Susanna when you were hearing some of the responses from Mia, Esther, or Robbie. What was the name of the theorist or scholar that uh, coined or like the sentence working with, within, and against? Atina Atanasiu. Okay. Um, okay, thanks. Sorry, very short question. I actually don't have quite. Um, sorry. So is it? Yes, I, I, I uh, don't have questions of sorts too much, but uh, Robbie, it's very interesting you address the subject of um, the colonialist um, attitude, sounds almost too harmless, of the Soviet Union. And um, it's very interesting that like 10 years ago, if you would, and actually I did address that curatorially and also published a bit, address the subject with Russian colleagues, they would not really know what you were talking about. Um, I think in post-Soviet Russia, it was first and foremost the artists who addressed that topic, like uh, Almagul Menlibayeva from Kazakhstan, but also in Moscow, Irina Karina, uh, Olga Shanisheva, who saw the misery of these... Um, um, like laborers from the former Soviet satellite states and so on. And now it's it's kind of this debate is uh, being established also because um, you could really see the um, um, characteristics of colonialist suppression as put by Omi Baba uh, that really apply to the former Soviet uh, Republics, like it's the um, erasure of the um, original language of religion, economic uh, dependency. So uh, there is actually no question about it, and it's really time uh, that there's more theory about that. Thank you, Robbie, mm -hmm. for mentioning it. Yeah, yeah, and just to follow on from there in art history, it's Piotrowski uh, who has um, uh, said that. Eastern, Central Eastern European art is uh, always in need of referring to Western um, precedent and uh, put itself into the isms, into the trajectories and so on, and that, that in itself, that it cannot stay on its own uh, ground in a way, is a sign of it being um, uh, not Western, yeah. Um, even if you see geographically uh, where the the area from Portugal to the Urals uh, finds its uh, geographical middle, even if you have art from there, it still has to explain itself in relation to Western um, examples. So that means it's not Western. Uh, I think that needs to be explained as well. Um, but I, so yeah, um, if you want, um, what I wanted to. Uh, do is draw a line here um, and, and say that what Esther elaborated about the theme of the documenta and its concerns to bring all of these uh, collectives from around the world together um, is a continuation from, in my view, uh, from what you did, uh, drawing a historical line, a trans-historical line from uh, these early uh, Soviet sort of revolutionary artists with their enthusiasm trying to overcome 
overcome uh, the Tsarist oppression and serfdom and uh, uh, your feudalism, uh, basically, and the treatment of um, minority and other regions like that. So can we borrow... Um, strategies, artistic strategies from here and there as Documenta is doing it clearly with artists of a certain generation or the ones that are living now and accessible and so on um, but that comparativity is itself at stake is it not? I think that is uh, what interests me about this discussion. May I still? Yeah, please. please. Uh, um, you talked about Piotr, Piotr Piotrowski the late Polish art historian after whom now is an entire institute uh, called in uh, Poznan. Um, he's my hero in a way because he really established that rewriting, a model of rewriting art history of the so-called East, and he wasn't shy of really calling the East not or like Central Eastern or other uh, terminologies that have been tried out. He, he really said the post-communist East. And, um, but he has also, uh, he's my hero because he's done this kind of horizontal art history or it, at, at least encouraged it tremendously. Um, I, I learned from him via, let's say, Hungarian or Polish uh, curators' exhibitions or publications that uh, with utter... Um, How's it called? Uh, there's no English word. Like with the matter of factness, established connections between the art uh, behind Iron Curtain art in Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, no, Czechoslovakia, and Romania, uh, Romania, and so on. Whereas the territory of the former GDR was not included because there is no Western Poland or no Western Hungary or anything that prevents you from doing this horizon, horizontal ho horizontal um, um, over, overview of, of these scenes. And um, Piotrowski was actually the one who said, um, GDR, it's, it's part of the East. It's like the, the, the um, intensity of surveillance, of oppression, uh, free th thought and everything varies to small degrees. And uh, what these scenes all shared, including Eastern Germany, was subversiveness. Um, and even in GDR, because censorship and oppression was even a little bit stronger than, let's say, in Hungary or Romania, um, um, the political activism in the art scene, what Amir thankfully talked about, uh, was stronger because when the repression is stronger, the uh, artistic or aesthetic or political answers are stronger accordingly. And this has so far not really been uh, uh, researched or, or um, honored on the other hand side our dear Piotr Piotrowski, in his horizontal reading of art history and like also contributing to global history before the term was coined. Uh, when you read his book, the Shadow of Yal in the Shadow of Yalta, you will find almost no women artists, and if you find them, they are all compressed into one chapter about body art. Uh, and I mean, this is this is uh, kind of shame. I still admire him, but this is shameful. Uh, he left out important artists as Dora Maurer and her conceptual work, or Magdalena Abakanowicz. I mean, imagine the Polish uh, artist who's just having this retrospective at the Tate. And uh, so there, there are shortcomings, and I, I don't know, this is not the point here, but do read such books critically. Also read The Invisible Omissions oh, yeah, with it. Absolutely. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can also continue on Piotr Piotrowski because I, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I also admire his work, but I think uh, I haven't read the book. It just came out. This horizontal art history. There's a new book that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I haven't read it yet, but but uh, but what I think the the main problem with Piotrowski for me is that he really tried to build this idea of horizontal art history, that there's no center. But I think 
he still places the center in Eastern Europe. So you cannot, he's tried to go beyond that, but, the, but his center is still Eastern Europe, I think. So I think it's, it's really hard to be global in a sense that... Um, it, Sorry for interrupting. I think this has to be done first yeah. before we can establish this, uh, like for more than, I don't know, 50 decades, even during the Iron Curtain, the Western art scene has always served as the example uh, with which everything was compared. And uh, I think now is the time, and this is almost, no, this is a purely academic uh, methodology to research and to compare the East with the East and um, with marginalized territories, with the peripheries, which we all call global art history. So uh, has this been done? in the, I don't know, far or near future, then we can happily start to introduce the West again in some, uh, as some standard among others. Yeah, but I mean, uh, then the question arises, do we um, find in the East self-colonized people emulating the West, or do we also find uh, ways of yeah, um, new approaches to dissidents that could actually lead us to, to understanding uh, something that, let's say, uh, the Extin Extinction Rebellion would want to uh, um, use or uh, appropriate to their own needs today? Do you find that there are um, Russian revolutionary artists that could um, uh, serve as examples um, for, for uh, work that needs to be done against Orban today? Do we um, find uh, strategies in art uh, that keep our leaders here honest, um, justice ministers who say uh, that wokeism is a threat to democracy or I mean, you can look to the midterm elections and the uh, elections in the Brazil and so on. Democracy is, is uh, in need of um, <laughs> defending and various regimes are in need of, of being held to account. So do we find these tactics now in this material that has been presented to us? Do we? <laughs> well, I don't know if I can answer that question all by myself. Um, I know, but I, I think you we have been in, in touch so much about activism and and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things for me, to, and maybe this is a question I want to put out before I open it up for the audience to come back to this this term collective because I think that this has a very mm, strong force. In the, in the conditions we are living in now. But the, I think there's always this tricky part about how to hmm, hold it accountable to itself, if this makes sense. You, you know, I mean, I think I too am a, am a supporter of, of artist collectives, but of collective work in general. But I think, and this is one of the things with, with your work, Susanna, is that it really forces me, or dare I say us, whoever I mean with that, but me, okay, to, um, to try to think about how I imagine a collective, like you actually said yesterday so nicely, a collective that is made up of individuals, right? And this is, I think, exactly, this is, I think, something that... Uh, uh, there are strategies now, but I, you, you know, that that are that different people are using. But I see this as a sort of a moment where there's a lot of friction that's happening now around to what extent these two can sit together in a way that feels, let's say, politically productive, right? Uh, and and I go, I'll go to something I am consistently talking about: is the you know this this taking up of collective without uh, holding ourselves accountable to the risk differentials that different kinds of individual bodies come into a collective with, then what is the, what is the point? And this is a sort of, I would say, in these sort of, quote, leftist scenes, a moment where I find a lot of um, uh, uh, dissonance in terms of how to actually have a strategy that can hold that in place 
as well. Because this, I think, is something, uh, otherwise we risk falling into kind of romanticized ideas of what the collective is, and we lose sight of, um, we, I shouldn't talk about we, I, I the, the, the circles that I'm moving in, lose sight of that, that the, what has to actually be centered is these kinds of questions of safety, uh, and of protection of the of the ecosystem in this way, but also of all of the different bodies, human or not, that kind of make up these ecosystems. So this, I think, would be where I would say we have a lot of work to do, actually, to get that figured out. And I think going back, and this is why for me tonight, going back to thinking about the 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 good and the bad that comes with a, a term like collective or collectivity is a really important thing. That's not just like to do tonight, but to keep doing over and over in, in public settings, but also in the ones you know that we are all personally kind of involved in. Um, I, that sounded a bit grandstandy, but I didn't mean it this way. But this is really where I am, until I'm blue in the face. This question of risk differentials really has to be taken into account for uh, for what I understand to be a, a, like a, a productive leftist conversation, even otherwise. We're in a romanticization of these kind of um, early periods, of, you know, that dictatorships essentially of the collective. On that, I don't mean to overwhelm, but I, I, unless somebody wants to share anything, I want to open it. I'm going to take one of the mics. Sorry, I can't pass my Madonna mic. Um, uh, I, I want to open. Ah, thank you so much. So if there are questions out in the audience, we'll take about 10 minutes, unless it gets r really r roaring, the conversation. Otherwise, in about 10 minutes, maybe we'll, we'll try to wrap up. But please do ask. Take a second. Or comment. Or comment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for this, um, but um, I was thinking uh, a lot like I'm Hungarian, uh, raised in the Netherlands, and uh, my work is uh, a lot about uh, like researching uh, the East European, like uh, the regime before the time, before the regime change, and I went to get uh, the documents, I went to went to the archives to get, receive the documents of my grandfather who was part of all this um, of the um, yeah, from the democratic opposition and I spoke with some people that have uh, some names that I found in these uh, archives papers and um, I spoke with one woman and her name is Hai Agnes or Agnes Hai and um, it was a very interesting conversation she was the only woman that I could spoke, speak to because mostly they were men but um, anyway uh, she said that why we why there was always this um, looking to the West was because of the hope. And I thought that was a kind of interesting uh, um, yeah, vision, actually. And also her other, and I wanted to share that somehow, because I thought, like, if you, like we were saying, in the, when you are in a, living in a repressed situation, uh, how to do it within and without, as Esther was saying, but... This is also kind of the hope way or believing and then with believing and getting a better sit to, to hope for the better, let's say. Um, and also she was also saying that she thought the collective was actually not stupid, that in 1956, um, the, when uh, the regime was uh, made by by the humans, by the people, by the, by the citizens, and that was for her... Uh, a hope again, but also a show that 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 within living in a repression, that the people are not stupid. And I thought that was a very interesting and nice um, idea to think on and to continue on. Um, uh, I don't know what your ideas are about this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this idea of hope of looking to the west or i i've talked to several um artists from uh, an older generation that sort of also expressed this feeling but then uh when there was the collapse or these were artists that were working in the soviet union 
um, they were all very disappointed by this um, by this West at the same time. Yeah, and this hope, and they were like, "Whoa, is this it?" And they all like they went into a depression, like or literally many of them. So yeah, I think this is uh, yeah also an interesting um, yeah interesting fact. Absolutely. After 1989, uh, this uh, other realm, the outside, has sort of gone, it seems, yeah? Um, but it still exists in relation uh, often to the global north and the global south. Those who arrive on the uh, uh, policed borders of the EU are driven to us, to here, uh, by that same kind of uh, hope. And, uh, yeah, there is no outside uh, anymore, no um, yeah, clearly defined uh, thing that we can point to a place that is uh, a democratic paradise or something like that. In many places in the world, um, it's called Amsterdam. <laughs> um, it's a... It's a very interesting place to be where there are many people coming with that hope, uh, thinking that this is, is really where where they can have it. And then they find similar people <laughs> who value similar things and um, maybe also find other things to criticize quite similarly. Um, but what I actually picked up the microphone to say was that um, many of you are students, clearly, and you are a, a collective within an institution that has grown uh, from its colonial roots, like all of these buildings have. Um, so, <laughs> not a surprise, is it? <laughs> so, is there a strategy that uh, you can identify for your own uh, decolonizing behavior, or uh, how do you feel that you're listening to this material? And, uh, okay, uh, there were people who were uh, yeah, taking on um, revolutionary iconographies and doing different things with them. Do these forms still mean something? I'm really interested in what you think about that. <laughs> Anisha. <laughs> Hello, hi, my name is Arniza. Thank you for uh, this discussion. So I was got really intrigued by Pietro Protovsky's being brought up. So I was like, well, I remember him and where. So then I looked it up and I realized that on November 7, 2007, he gave a talk in the Netherlands during this program called Former West. And was interesting, I looked it up, and it was actually also with Oak We Answer, was part of the same day of talks, and I was looking through it, and I thought like, whoa, so many years have passed since then, and I'm still surprised that that is still in the website, and I don't know if any of you know if this program was like a sort of series of discussions, uh, talks, artistics, philosophers coming to Rotterdam and thinking of this the fall of the Iron Curtain, but also thinking of the former West instead of the former East. I don't know if any of you uh, was present or knew about it, and I thought the coincidence was interesting, and wonder if you have any thoughts, like reflections from that period, like how also what was East and West has changed so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Anissa. I wasn't here yet, and I've se similarly seen it all on, online. Um, the project Former West is one that uh, Bach uh, took to this huge publication there uh, two or three years ago. And when I read that, with um, some Eastern European contributions, or uh, and Boris Groys uh, uh, commenting and all the usual suspects, I was actually really surprised that um, uh, the former West was being formed in only sort of Western-centric decolonial ways. And exactly. that um, uh, there was no intimation whatsoever that um, uh, look, by looking at the East, one may form or the West. It's very clear that the East was formed by being uh, subsumed into the West, colonized, uh, some might say. 
Um, but that any thinking or art practice coming from the East that could participate in forming the West, that was, was completely absent. And therefore, I <laughs> kind of um, uh, provided a little sticking plaster in this lovely uh, book that uh, Van Abbe Museum made about global conceptualisms, and uh, that's online also. Um, just like the documenta with Juan Grupa's choice of many Dutch um, artist collectives or Dutch-based ones, and their uh, kind of horizon is very clear uh, coming from Indonesia that they didn't include Eastern Europe, um, that we needed to gather today here and, and actually put another little sticking plaster into uh, this debate and, or an addition to it. So that's that's how I uh, arrived at it. But thanks for mentioning uh, former West. But you're in agreement, I think. Oh, oh, def uh, definitely. But this is uh, um, like the terminology again. Othering is othering. Like you really have to define what this is all about, as you will have to define what the collective is all about. And I know for sure. Um, like most of them are still alive and we've collaborated recently you 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 they they get furious if you address them as a collective still after uh, over um 30 years because the concept of collective for them is a highly corrupted um one they call them they always called themselves a group an artist group a women artist group and um, I think that we also have the um, responsibility, and not only uh, uh, concerning the word collective, to really think about the essence of the respective phenomenon. And uh, if it's a group um, that nurtures the individual for the right cause, um, then it's a group. Then um, I, because I have the impression that in the last ten years, since Occupy or earlier, um, this kind of pseudo leftist terminology has taken over because, of course, collective sounds more dedicated or more radical or more progressive as just saying it's a group. And then, as a true nominalist that I am, um, who comes to to my workshop tomorrow, uh, I would say, well, let, then let's identify uh, what kind of group uh, this is, and not being seduced by um, by an uh, apparently um, leftist um, fig leaf. Anyway. <laughs> I have to, uh, just because I had, as I was preparing for the workshop tomorrow, I thought this was helpful for me to bring. I started a list of the different terms that instead of collective, like emerge, so group or group constellation, an informal coalition, a, a gang, a community organizing itself. So, I mean, I think something that you're bringing up right now also is... is um, to what extent do we need that actual time? Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm sorry for... Um, I think we should wrap it up uh, very soon. But uh, what was I going to say? Aha! Uh, in, in my research during the last month, I read somewhere, I really have to admit it was somewhere, um, that Marxism translated into Russian language brought forth the term kollektiv, um, Whereas it was by Marx, and I'm not sure about the German word, it must have been something else, like Gemeinwesen or Gemeinschaft, community or something like that. So from, I talked about Makarenko, um, this is like, I think, the epitome of what the socialist repressive uh, collective could be be turned into. Uh, and this terminology has been disseminated from the Soviet uh, cultural ideology into, um, I don't know, post-World War I, post-World War II uh, leftist movements. So 
let's really, I mean, this is not only an intuitive argument, uh, there is um, reasons for nominalism. <laughs> I think there was one more hand that went up uh, for, with a question or comment, which we can take, if you still want to. I will yeah. have the mic. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I was preparing for the workshop and reading your article, um, Suzanne, uh, over the yeah about them, and I thought it was interesting to what Esther mentioned and what we were talking about. Uh, what Mia was suggesting: how can this work be useful to us nowadays, working with, within, and against? And I was wondering if you could maybe relate that to your mention of utopias and heterotopias. So like how maybe some ideas make us a group, but then these ideas are not utopias, but can become places. Maybe there's something there about like um, hope, this idea of hope, like how when we imagine something, and it fails to materialize into a place, then we are disappointed, depressed, uh, we give up. So how do we make places together through our ideas might be an interesting... What's your name? Marta. Hi. Ma Marta. Um, let's elaborate on that tomorrow, like the idea of utopia, also in the Soviet avant-garde sense, and heterotopia in the Foucaultian sense. But to put it briefly, it's utopia is utopia. It's never fulfilled. Like most of the avant-garde monuments and plans have never materialized. And uh, a heterotopia, this is uh, these kind of places that are non-places, but organized in a rhizome-like uh, network. This is practical life. This is, this is where... Uh, well, the everyday utopia uh, can happen. So, yeah, maybe uh, for for now. But do remind me of that. And also, please be so kind as to remind me about, uh, maybe you keep it in mind, I will forget it, stylistics, stylistics of repression. This is something we really have need to talk about. Yeah, I think... I think we should go ahead and wrap it up. If there are other questions or comments, they can, of course, be shared with Susanna or with any of the roundtable participants while we have a drink, uh, which is just right around the corner from me. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Thank you so much, Susanna. Mia.